hear it. My praise is the shout. I bring Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How could I keep it? Cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you.
God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just as the man who was thrown on the bone of Elisha, if there's anything that he can do, just as the stone I was rolled at the tomb in the garden. Oh, 
take you at your word if you just say yes to the calling of God on your life. And what I see in this moment is that there are, all of us have good things. All of us have things that the Lord specifically put in our lives to further his kingdom. And you may think that the, the, have, the hobby that you have, the thing that you just naturally do, oh, that can't be God. That's just what I do. And yet the Lord says, yeah, but I put it in you. Let's go. So what I see us doing right now is just lifting up. I'm going to ask Lord to reveal to you the gifting specifically on your life. Like Chloe is, in a great, is an amazing artist. And Katie's a, a great writer. She's actually a ghostwriter for other people. She makes other people look good. You're a soccer player. Come up here. Come up here. She's like, do I have to? So you see how shy she is right now? platform on the soccer field and while you're shy now God is working in your heart he's going to put a fire and a zeal in you and the day will come when you will say God gave me these legs and the ability to kick that ball and score goals and help my teammates to declare the word of God you're going to touch your teams and you're going to roll that ball around the world So, using that as an illustration, but I just like playing soccer. How could God use that? How could God use anything? Say, Lord, if you could use a donkey, you can use me. Just cup your hands like this and say, Lord, I give you whatever gift things I have and increase them so that I can use them for your glory. Let your glory shine through me on the written page, on the verbal page, in the marketplace, the gift of administration, the gift of prophecy. People, there are some of you in here who, have the call, who are called to prophesy and you've kind of quenched that. You've second guessed yourself and God's like, how about we not do that anymore? How about you just say yes when I tell you to say something on the street? How about you just say yes? So, Father, you know exactly what you've called each person to do. Writing songs. Writing songs, worshiping the Lord, called to missions, to go around the world. And she knows it. Called to release the roar of God in worship.
we seek your face this morning we don't just come to you with our needs seeking your hand but we seek your face 
audience with you, Lord. We want to give you all the honor and the glory and the praise that you are worthy of. This is for you, Lord. Can we say this? This is for you, Lord. This is for you, Lord. My heart is for you, Lord. My song is for you, Lord. My life is for you, Lord. Lord, it's the least we can do because you gave your all for us. And we love you in return. Thank you, Lord, for first loving us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I understand a lady was washing dishes and began to worship the Lord. And this song was born that has been sung around the world for decades. Amazing. So keep worshiping the Lord. Do everything you do, whatever you do, do for him, his glory, even if it's washing dishes. Hallelujah. Can we show some love to our team today? Thank you guys so much for leading us before the Lord in praise. Also, let's show some love to the people that put these boxes together. Thank you so much. All right, are you ready to hear the word? Can we show some love to Kyla Cassis? Come right on. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to, to be back here with you guys. I know I see a lot of familiar faces. I've been at the, um, I forget what they're called, the, the yearly tea parties that we have. I've been to several of those here at the church. I've been to a lot of Bible studies. Um, and so I've had the, the honor to meet a lot of you. And so I'm excited to be back this morning. Um, and I, I, first of all, just want to honor you. Um, Yvette and Alan, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate your leadership and um, your uh, wisdom that you carry in every conversation. And so I'm, I'm super honored to be uh, sharing here at your church this morning. Um, so I am with an organization called Overland Missions. My name is Kyla Cassis, um, if I haven't met you yet. And our organization is really focused. You'll see out in the um, foyer there, we have a table set up if you want some more information. Um, but we're really focused on going to the most remote and neglected uh, people groups in the world and preaching the gospel face to face. Um, there, you know, there are many organizations that go to cities and have crusades, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's just that, you know, we are set on what our goal and our vision is. And our goal and our vision is to go to the places where people aren't going and to, to uh, take those rough roads. You know, we take, uh, we have military trucks. Um, if you come over to the, um, the table that we have set up, you can see some pictures. But we have these massive military trucks that we're literally taking sometimes 12 hours out into the bush, into the middle of nowhere. We're chopping down trees. We're crossing rivers. We're literally doing whatever we have to do to get the gospel to these people. And so that's a little bit about Overland Missions. This year, specifically, I was in, um, since we're streaming, I won't say where, I was in the Middle East, um, Zambia, Zanzibar, and, uh, sorry, not Zanzibar, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I can't forget that with Pastor Yvette. That's her, her home country, if you didn't know that. Um, so we've been able to, to bond over that a little bit. But um, it was a great time of um, just really seeing, I, I feel like this year, more than ever, I really saw the fruit of, of what it looks like to go into a country for a short period of time and then leave. Um, you know, we, we have our expeditions that go in for two weeks at a time. We preach the gospel, we leave. Of course, we have follow-up. And we have long-term people in the area that are discipling and all of those things. But what I'm talking about is specific to the trips that we take, the two-week trips. So often people say, what fruit can those actually have? What fruit can it go? You're there for a week. How can you preach to someone and see their life completely changed? And I feel like this year, I saw a glimpse of what it looks like, the, the fruit of past seasons that I've been to these nations. Um, for example, so as I went to Zimbabwe this year, we went to a different area that we've never been to before. Um, but we, I picked up the, the same translators that we had from the last expedition over a year ago. And so we took them with us, and um, one of them, her name is Pastor Grace, and we've become really good friends, and I love her dearly. Um, she was sharing with me, do you remember on the last expedition, there was a blind man that we prayed for, and I remember we were there for hours praying for this man to be healed, believing the word of God that when you lay hands on the sick that you'll recover. 
And we were praying for this man for hours and hours and hours. And I remember he, he, there was like little tiny improvement, but he really, he wasn't healed, like just black and white. He wasn't healed. And um, so we left thinking, you know, that's it. Praise God. There was other healings. There was things that he did, but we left that day believing fully in faith that, that he's going to be healed. And a year later, I'm talking with Pastor Grace, and she says, you remember that blind man? I think his name was William. I could be a little bit off on that. And I was like, yes, I remember. And she said, he's healed, and he's walking around. He, before, he couldn't even leave his area of his house because he couldn't see. Now, walking in full healing a year later. And he, she was like, it just kept getting better and better after you guys left. You know, he, he was walking in healing. Um, there was another girl and she said, and you remember the girl with epilepsy? There was a girl that literally we would pray for her and she would just drop down and like faint and she would have seizures and all of these horrible, horrible things. And we prayed for her multiple, multiple times. And she actually, um, she was delivered of, of some different spirits and things like that. And so that's all that I knew. You know, it's kind of like, how do you tell if someone is still experiencing epilepsy until it's a year later and they haven't had seizures. You know what I mean? And so we get, you know, a, a year later, you remember that girl? Yeah, I remember her. No seizures since you guys have left. In the same way, there was another one. This is, this is one of my favorite ones. There was a, a girl and she came to us and she said, um, you know, I've had, I think, honestly, I think she said about 15 miscarriages, like over and over and over and over. Every time she would get pregnant, miscarriage, miscarriage, miscarriage. And she's like, will you guys pray for me? And I'm like, yes, of course. And I remember like in, in the moment, I'm like, okay, we need to pray for healing. So I'm praying for healing. And all of a sudden, I just felt the Lord say, this isn't healing, this is a deliverance. And so I said, okay, let's go for it. And so we start basically casting out this spirit that is causing these miscarriages. As it's happening, her eyes are closed. And she starts saying out loud what she's seeing internally, if that makes sense. So she's saying out loud, I'm seeing there's these uh, people like hooded figures in all black. And they're taking these babies and they're throwing them into a pit. And they're throwing these babies in a pit. She's experiencing, she's weeping. She's experiencing this in her whole being, right? She's physically in the room with me, but she's having this experience. And so we continue casting out, casting out, casting out. Long story short, um, she was delivered of the demons. But of course, it's one of those things. How do you know if she's actually healed until later? Um, she comes to me, Pastor Grace, you remember that woman? Yes, I remember her. She now has a baby, like in her hands, has a baby. And so it's been, it was a great time this year of just seeing the fruit of a short-term expedition. And so I just want to say, first and foremost, to any of you, if you have a, a desire, any sort of desire at all to do something like this, or you're wondering, is it impactful? Or you're wondering, can I be used? The answer is absolutely yes. And we would love to have you. So um, we have a table out there. Uh, feel free to, to come and sign your name and we'll just give you some more information. We have some pamphlets as well that you can grab and take with you. Um, unfortunately, after the service, I probably won't be able to be by the table, um, but just feel free to sign your name, take some pamphlets, any of that stuff. Last year, I talked about the fear of the Lord. And I talked about how um, the fear of the Lord plus the comfort of God equals multiplication. I don't know if you guys remember that. It was basically a day full of equations. That's probably, if you took anything from it, that's probably what you remember. But we talked a lot about fear of the Lord plus the comfort of God equals multiplication. And I talked about what each of those different things are and how it can lead to multiplication. And so this year, I want to talk about something similar, but I want to take the focus off of multiplication and, and go a little bit deeper into the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? And I, I want, as, as I'm speaking, I, I know that there's always a temptation. You're hungry. You're wanting to go to lunch. You're thinking about what you have to do for the rest of the day. This is a heavy message. This is a message of extreme importance. And not because I'm speaking it, but because it's the word of the Lord. And so I want you, as I'm speaking, just really try to not even, don't even listen to the sound of my voice. Just lean in. What is the Lord doing in your heart? What is he bringing up within you? What convictions is he leading you to? 
and I want you to lean into that. So we're talking about this today because I, I want to read some scriptures that kind of talk about why we're talking about the fear of the Lord. And I will explain what that means if you don't know what that means. Luke 150 says his mercy extends to those who fear him. Proverbs 1 7 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Deuteronomy 5.29 says, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Psalm 34.9 says, Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. So these different, of course, and there's probably hundreds in the Bible. These are just a couple of examples, right? But what I'm saying is the reason that the fear of the Lord is so important is because his mercy is extended to those who fear the Lord. The uh, beginning of knowledge is in the fear of the Lord. It will go well for you and your children forever if you fear the Lord. Those who fear him lack nothing. How many of us want to lack nothing? I know I do. The key to this is the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is the key to receiving the blessings of God, and it's the key to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It's the key to your intimacy with him. Really, honestly, everything that that you're wanting in your life of faith in God is gonna be found in the the fear of the Lord. It's a key component, a key ingredient to these things. Okay, so what is the fear of the Lord? It is not to be fearful, right? Um, I love this scripture. Exodus 20, 20 says, do not fear for God has come to test you that his fear may be before you. So it's saying, do not fear, but instead fear, right? It's, it's a little bit confusing. What does that mean? Do not fear by the world standards. Do not fear man. Do not fear circumstances. Instead, fear the Lord. There's a difference there. Fear of man, fear in the world standards, causes you to hide from him. How many of you remember in, in Genesis, when, whenever Adam and Eve sinned, they sinned, And then what did they do? They hid from God. Why? They had no fear of the Lord, which is why they sinned in the first place. But they they gained a fear, a worldly fear, a the by the world standard, they gained a fear, and it caused them to hide from God. Fear of the Lord doesn't cause you to hide from him, it causes you to run to him. This is the difference. Okay, so on a on a surface level, we're gonna get a little deeper, but on a surface level, to fear the Lord is to love what God loves and hate what God hates, right? I know a lot of people are like, what do you mean God hates? It, he absolutely hates. It's all in the Bible. He hates anything. This is, this is what I want you to hear. He hates anything that is going to be bad for us, anything that's gonna hinder our relationship with him. He hates it. In the same way, how many of you, if you have a, a son or a daughter and maybe they're, let's say they, they get into drugs or something like that, you're gonna hate that thing. There's actually gonna be a hatred within you for the thing that causes a a dissension between you and your child, right? In the same way, God hates anything that comes between us and him. And so in the same way, we should hate those things as well. It's in his love. It's because of his love for us that he hates the things that comes between us and him. In the same way, if we have a love for God, we should hate anything that tries to come in between that relationship. So religion hates what God loves, right? It's the opposite. You see the Pharisees, and yes, they had the word of God, and yes, they had, you know, they followed all the laws and they did all the right things, but they didn't necessarily hate the sin. They hated the people. They they judged the people, right? And this is what religion does. It looks and it, it judges the people. But there's two sides of this coin. There's one where, yes, so religion comes in and it hates people, but then there's another side where you get a little too comfortable and you so love the people that you, I'm not gonna say you love their sin, but you definitely condone it and you definitely don't say anything about it. Even with ourselves, I'll say, and I heard uh, someone say this, there's a, a path to righteousness, right? The Bible talks about we walk on a path of righteousness. There's a divot on both sides of that path. One side is religion, where you're hating what God loves. You're, you're judging people. You're, you are um, walking in judgment toward people. But
But then the other side is, I love people so much and so everything is okay. I'm now okay with everything. Don't worry, you don't have to change your life. God loves you just as you are. Is that wrong? No, he does love you just as you are, but does he want you to stay there? Absolutely not. And so this is the fear of the Lord is what keeps you on that path. It keeps you out of religion, but also out of complacency, out of judgment toward people, but also out of um, condoning or not even condoning, but accepting or allowing these other, you know, sins in people's lives. We have to hate. Let me just be very clear. We have to hate anything that comes between us and God. We should hate anything that's causing a separation from people and God hate those things because we know what it is to have a relationship with him. As an example of this, um, I was a little bit of a problem child for my, <laughs> for my parents. I got in a lot of trouble. Um, and when I would get in trouble, my parents would try to punish me. And sometimes they would take away my, my cell phone, right? Well, that didn't really phase me very much. Honestly, I would just go and buy another one. I, bought a, I would go and buy a $20 track phone from Walmart. And so it's like, there was literally nothing, their punishment did nothing for me. Maybe it stopped me in the moment, but either way, I was gonna keep doing what I was gonna doing. There was, there was no um, reverence for my parents. There was no, like, I understand what you're saying. I don't want to hurt your heart. I'm going to, you know, it was like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And punishment honestly kind of fueled that fire a little bit. How many of you know you try to punish your kids and they're like, I'm going to rise up even more? That's the, that's the reality. Punishment oftentimes fuels your disobedience, right? Fear in the negative sense fuels disobedience a lot of times. But I remember there was one moment <clears throat> and I had been talking back to my mom and I had been, you know, all the whatever, things like that, that you're not supposed to be doing. I was talking back, I was doing all of that. And I remember there's one moment and I vividly remember it. And my mom sat me down and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, you know, when you talk like that to me, it hurts me. And I'm, I'm hurt by you when you do those things. And in that moment, the reality of what I was doing set in. And that is what drove me to, to change my language. That is the thing that caused me to change everything. It wasn't, she could yell, she could take away my phone, she could punish me, she could instill fear in me. But the only thing that actually got me to change my heart toward it was when she said, you're hurting me. And now it was no longer the fear of punishment that was driving my actions, but it was the fear of grieving my mom. The fear of being punished can only take you so far, but it's an external fear. The fear of the Lord that I'm talking about is rooted in an internal love. And that's when things change. It's driven. The fear is driven by love. I love you, mom, so much that I don't want to hurt you. I fear hurting you. I fear causing you pain, right? That's what should be, that's what should drive our fear of the Lord in the same way. And so, our fear of the Lord is no different. It's not because we're scared of punishment. It's because we don't want to damage the heart or relationship of the one that we're hurting. Ephesians 4, 30 through 32 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. This is what it is to fear the Lord. I don't want to grieve you. I'm fearful of grieving you. I love you so much. I see your heart. I see that you're good. I see that you're for me. I don't want to grieve you with everything that's in me. Therefore, I'm going to be obedient. That's what the fear of the Lord is. I want to go kind of back to uh, what we talked about. I want to kind of recap last year a little bit. Um, Jeremiah 32, and we're going to be there for a little bit. So if you want to go ahead and turn there with me, Jeremiah 32, and we're going to just really kind of break down verses, uh, 39 through 41, verse by verse, Jeremiah 32, 39 through 41. All right. So starting in verse 39 says, I will give them one heart and one way 
that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. Okay, so he says, he's giving, I'm big on equations. You're gonna, you're gonna get this. You're gonna get, get that from me. So what I see in this is he says, there's one heart and one way that they may fear me. One, one heart posture plus one way equals fearing him. Okay, so we're trying, I, I'm trying to walk you through, how do you fear God? What is it to fear God? What does it mean to fear God? So this is the formula that God gives. One heart plus one way equals the fear of the Lord. So we're gonna talk about what is the heart and what is the way. Um, the, the first component, the heart, this speaks of our understanding or revelation of God. And in the next verse, I think that the next verse actually shows what should our understanding of God, how do we need, how do we need to realign our understanding of God to be in the heart posture that he's calling us to be in? Verse 40 says, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts. Okay, so the fear of him is put in our hearts through the revelation that he's good, through the revelation that he will not turn away from doing good to us, that he's made an everlasting covenant. I don't know if any of you know what covenant is or how deep it is. It is binding. It can never be broken. He's made an everlasting covenant with us through Jesus that he will, that he will do good to us, that it's, that's who he is. He's everlasting good. He's always good. He's the literal definition of good. You know, when we think of what is good, actually that word is defined by God originally. It can't be defined by what are the human standards of good and then we attribute that to God. That's not how it works. God is good. He is love. Love and goodness are literally defined by the character of God. The reason that we even know what love is is because he exists is because he is love, is because he is who he says he is. So he's covenanted to do good to us, which causes us to fear him. This goodness is his covenant and his inability to be unfaithful to it. He, is, he has an inability to, to break his covenant, and yet he's covenanted to be good. It can't be broken. It can never be broken. That means he is eternally good in every situation. I think oftentimes hearing that people are a little bit like, are you sure? Are you sure that's what the fear of the Lord is? I thought we were supposed, he's powerful, scary, and all of these things. Like, are you sure that that's what that means? This is a completely different revelation. Why would we fear being punished? We don't have a fear of punishment. We're in the new covenant where the punishment for our sin has been placed on Jesus. There is no punishment for our sin. And like, he's not gonna, what I'm saying is, he's not gonna punish you for your sin, that's not the heart of God. He's already punished our sin through Jesus. That's the entire reason that he went to the cross. Therefore, our fear is not rooted in punishment. It's rooted in love. It's rooted in thank you, Lord, for your love that went so far as to go to the cross for me, that went so far as to receive death in your mortal body, to take the whippings, to take the lashings, to take, you know, the spear in his side. This is what it is to fear the Lord. We fear him because we love him and we fear him because we don't want to grieve his heart. Proverbs 28, 14 says, blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. And what I think is interesting about that is that he gives one, he gives one um, statement and then he says, but, and then gives another statement, which means that the first statement and the second statement are, are two opposites of each other, okay? So what he's saying is the opposite of trembling is hardening your heart. So if the opposite of trembling is hardening your heart, that means that softening your heart is actually what leads us to tremble before him. Softening your heart, what does that mean, softening your heart? Softening your heart to his character, to see who he is in his fullness, in his goodness. He is eternally good. To to see and believe in the character of God that he's good, that he's for you. You soften your heart toward him and it causes you to tremble at the greatness of God. Why? Because you look at yourself and you're realizing, wow, 
I was not worthy of this, but he made me worthy. Wow, I was not um, deserving of this, but he did it anyways. Wow, this was the reality of my life. This is who I was before I know him. And now all of a sudden, all of these things are accessible to me. He's so good. I'm, I can't even believe it. I'm trembling before you. This is what causes us to tremble. What if everything that, that we thought that we knew about God wasn't a reality? And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the, the misconceptions that we have about God, the, the um, anger that we attribute to him, the, the um, being fearful of him that we attribute to him. What if he isn't angry? What if he isn't controlling? What if he isn't, let, hear this, what if he isn't religious? That's a big one. What if he isn't condemning or judgmental? What you've thought about God your whole life that's kept you away from church, that's kept you away from intimacy. Maybe you're coming now to appease someone. What if those things about God aren't true? What if it's just what you've heard from man? What if it's just something that you've read and had a misunderstanding? Could that be true? It makes me think of, um, you know, in, in Genesis, when it talks about a lot of, so when we go overseas and we're preaching the gospel, a lot of times we do start in Genesis. Um, the reason being is, is that literally sometimes people have no idea about the entire gospel. They don't know how they were created. They don't know, you know, what happened in the garden. They don't know about Adam and Eve, all of those things. And so a lot of times we'll start there and we'll say, okay, in the beginning there were trees and God created the earth and God did this and God, you know, like give the entire creation story. And what I've heard so often when people are sharing about what happened is they say, and then Adam sinned and Eve sinned. And then God kicked them out of the garden because God is holy. And now they were no longer holy. So he had to get them out of his presence. And is that technically wrong? I guess not. But what it does is it creates a mindset in us now that, that there's a separation between us and God. He's holy. Therefore, if I'm acting outside of holiness, I can't have a relationship with God. If I'm acting outside of holiness, it creates, it creates a punishment mentality because then you are, um, you're, you're fearful that he's, gonna, that he's gonna disapprove of you constantly. And it's, it's that punishment mindset that actually drives you further into sin than into his arms. So what I wanna say is, and that example with Adam the Bible doesn't say that he kicked them out because he was holy and they weren't. Was that true at that point? Yes, but that's not why he kicked them out. He ate, they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? They now had this, this knowledge of sin and evil and all of these things. And it says uh, in Genesis three, God says, now I'm gonna remove them from the garden lest they take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Meaning that he didn't want them, if they would now eat from the tree of life, they would live eternally in this state of sin consciousness. They would live eternally in this state of um, an, uh, separation from God, an awareness of sin, more awareness of sin than they had of God. And God was saying, I don't want them to live like this forever. There's gonna be a day where I send my son to die on the cross and he's gonna bridge that separation that they had from me. He's gonna take that sin, that sin that they did. He's taking it on his body. He, him who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And he's saying, I'm gonna send my son to the cross with the sins on him that they committed right now. And he's gonna, redo, he's gonna redo it. He's gonna reverse it all. And so he was saying, therefore, that they don't eat the tree of life and live forever in this fallen state, I'm gonna remove them from the garden. I'm gonna remove the possibility of that even happening because I already have a plan for redemption. Do you see how this thought process changes actually what you believe about God? Because when it starts in the beginning and you're saying, God is holy, we are not. He's far away, he's not personal, right? When you start with that thought process, it changes everything. But let me just say, what if everything that you knew about the gospel, what if everything that you thought that you knew about God wasn't true? What if he's good? 
what if, what if he's good? What if the, the sickness that you have in your body wasn't caused by God? What if the, the sickness that someone in your family has wasn't caused by God? What if God is grieving over those things? What if he's put the kingdom of God inside of you so that we would actually be the ones that reverse what the enemy is doing on the earth? What if? I have read the word of God, obviously, and I am convinced of the word. I'm convinced that what he says is true. I'm convinced that there is absolutely no other reality. I don't care what I see with my eyes. I'm convinced in the word of God. And now at this point in my life, talking about healing isn't just a song that I sing that makes me feel good. It's like if someone comes here and they want healing, and we'll, we can pray for healing after this service. But if someone comes to me, and let's say I don't see them healed, I promise you I will stay my, my conviction is so strong. I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken if you are healed. If you aren't healed, doesn't matter one bit to me because he is who he says he is. And I will stay there and I will pray until you're healed. Because as far as I'm concerned, that's what, that is the will of God. And I know that. I know that to be true. Why? Because I know he's good. I know that by his stripes, we were healed. I know that the word is true. We have to get to a place where we see the reality of the word, that the word is true above, above all else. This is what it looks like to fear the Lord over circumstances. I fear the Lord more than I fear someone not getting healed and me looking like I'm dumb. I fear the Lord more than that. I fear the Lord more than I fear, you know, I, I get up here and I say something that's dumb. I don't care. I fear the Lord more than that. I know that he's good. And because I know that he's good, I don't wanna grieve him. I don't wanna grieve his heart. If he speaks, then I move. If he says jump, I say how high, because I don't wanna grieve him, because I know that he's good, because I'm convinced of his goodness. So this is the, the first component of the, the fear of the Lord. Remember, it says one heart plus one way is fear of the Lord. This is the heart that we have to have. This is the heart that we have to have. It speaks of the revelation or understanding that we have of his goodness. Okay, second component is the way of the Lord. So there's a heart that we must have and then there's a way that we must go to walk in fear. Um, Genesis 18, 19 says, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Okay, so the way of the Lord is righteousness and justice. Um, Proverbs 8.13 says, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. We talked about this a little bit. Pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. We hate these things because they grieve the spirit of God within us. Um, let's see. There is only one heart and one way that can cause us to fear the Lord. You know, I'm reminded with, with my mom, when I, gave that, when I gave that story of my mom, I am not fearful of what she's gonna do to me. I'm not fearful of punishment. I'm not, it, you know, let's relate it to God. I'm not fearful that he's gonna punish me. I don't obey him because I think that he's gonna take something from me if I don't. I obey him because I love him. I obey him because he is good. He is worthy of being obeyed. I obey him because he is supreme because he is Lord, because he is God, because he is great, because he is good, because he is faithful. That's why I obey the Lord. So, and, and you know, talking back to my mom, it was, the, it was the love that I have for her that caused me to fear grieving her. The question is, do you love the Lord to that extent? How deeply do you love him? If you're not fearful of grieving his heart, that's a scary place to be. That's a scary place to be. I know this is heavy. Feel the weight of it. <laughs> like truly, don't walk out of this place taking this as something common. It's not. Do you love the Lord to the extent that you are actually fearful of grieving his heart? All right. 
That's the second thing. That's the way of the Lord. I want to put them together. I'm going to read uh, Jeremiah 32, 40 through 41. It says, I will give them one heart, which is our understanding of the goodness of God, and one way, which is obedience to when he speaks, that they may fear me forever. Why? For their own good and the good of their children after them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they will not turn away from me. I will rejoice in doing them good. And I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. This is his will for us, that he would do good to us, that we would see that he's made an everlasting covenant to be good to us. And when we can see that, then we can walk in obedience. And thus we're walking in the fear of the Lord. So he makes an everlasting covenant with us that he will not turn away from doing good to us. This puts the fear of God in our hearts so that we won't turn away from him or to say it better so that we turn to him. The fear of the Lord doesn't drive us away from him. It drives us closer to him. We tremble before him because we see him in his fullness without reservation. The greatness of who he is, the God, the God who created the, the entire universe, who created the stars in the sky, who created space, who created the earth, who created the different planets and set them in orbit. Like that God, the greatness, the vastness of who he is, we tremble before him because he is good and he is for us and he's covenanted to be good to us all the days of our lives. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a trip that ran into uh, Zanzibar. And Zanzibar is a um, island off the coast of Tanzania. If you've never heard, be- heard of it before, it's in Africa. And um, I wasn't actually on this trip, but this is a story from one of our teams. And uh, as they, they went out, there was a, a guy from America that came on their expedition. And he was from, I honestly, I'm going to butcher this. I don't know where he's from. He's from like West Virginia or something. He didn't speak another language. He only spoke English. And uh, one day they they were kind of talking with him. And basically they realized, I don't actually know if this guy's saved. Like, I think he's just coming on the trip. His girlfriend was on the trip. Normally we don't do things like that, just so that you know. But that is how it happened that day somehow. Um, So he gets on the trip. And we're like, you know, or they were like, you know, I don't know that he's actually saved. And so they started w- talking about him with it, uh, through it. And he's like, yeah, you know, like, I, I really want to dedicate my life to the Lord. Like, I think I'm ready. And so they start praying for him. And as they're praying for him, all of the sudden, he basically starts, I guess, speaking in tongues. And they're like, okay, awesome. He's being filled with the Holy Spirit. This is great. Such a sweet moment with God. We're going to leave the room, let him have his time with God, and then we'll come back. So they leave the room and they come back. He had ripped his shirt off and he is like yelling in another language. And they're like, what in the world? He's like crying. He's sweating. He's like basically like panicking, but yet speaking in another language. And they're like, what is happening? So they, they take the um, translators over to him. What they find out is he is speaking, I don't want to butcher it, I think it was seven different earthly languages, and he's just speaking about the, he's basically saying like, God is, I can't remember exactly what he was saying, but like, God is good, God is faithful, he is who he says he is. In these other earthly languages, Italian, Arabic, I think Swahili, um, I can't remember what they all were. There were seven different languages. And what had happened was he, was he was there with the Lord. And as they began to pray with him, honestly, it had nothing to do with what they were praying. God just decided, this is the moment. I'm not letting you be lukewarm anymore. There is no lukewarm. He had been lukewarm for his entire life. He had been on the fence. Maybe I'm in, maybe I'm not. I guess I'll go on this mission trip because my girlfriend's going. Like, I guess I'll go see what it's about. And God said, not anymore. You're here because I want you to be here. Not anymore. He literally, so he's speaking seven different languages. I think it was for four hours. He could not speak English. He would try and he couldn't speak English. He's crying and they call his parents and they're like, does he speak any other languages? 
They're like, no, he doesn't. They put him on the phone. He's like, mama, papa, like literally not even in English, like completely speaking these other languages and just terrified, not terrified that God's scary, terrified to see, wow, this is the the magnificence of this God that we serve. This is the power that he has. Wow, he's so good that he called me, that he didn't want me to be on the fence, that he didn't let me stay one foot in and one foot out, but that he pulled me in, right? This is the the magnificence of God. And you can guarantee every person on that trip had a fear of the Lord after that. They're like, what in the world? They actually, um, it was funny because they actually, he was speaking Italian and there was a lot of Italian tourists in Zanzibar. So they said, you know what? We're gonna postpone like ministry, like what they were supposed to do that day, their plans for ministry. And they said, we're gonna take him down to the beach and he's gonna preach the gospel to the, uh, to the Italian tourists. And they did, and people were getting saved. And he's walking down the street. People are falling out as he's walking by them. And he's like, blah, 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 blah. like I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, you know, and just completely like, this is not a religious guy. This is not a church going guy. This is not a guy that knows anything about that. He just came on the trip because his girlfriend came. And then all of a sudden the Lord came in and took over and was like, no, I'm done with you being on the fence today. I paid the ultimate price so that you wouldn't have to live like that anymore. I paid the ultimate price so that you wouldn't have to live in your sin anymore. How dare you? How dare you take that for granted? How dare you still live in the frailty of who you are? Live in the reality of what I've called you to be. And so I love love that story. But um, you might say that you believe this, but if you really believed it, how would it change the way that you lived your life? How would it change the way that you pray? And what I'm talking about when I say this, I'm talking about the reality of the greatness of God. If you believed that, if you believed it, If you believed God was good, how would it change the way you prayed? If you believed that um, you didn't have to have sickness in your body, if you believed it wasn't the will of God, if you truly believed it, how would it change the way you prayed? If you truly believed that he wanted to have intimacy with you, that he died to be close to you, that if you truly believed that he spoke, how often would you ask him his opinion? If you, believed that, if you believed that he still moved and answered your prayers, if you, if you had faith for him to answer every prayer that you prayed, how often would you pray? I think for me, it would actually be nonstop. God, th- I need this and I need this. And obviously I'm talking selfishly, but I'm just saying like, how often, what would it change if you really believed it? I don't wanna hear you say that you believe it to me and yet you're not praying. I don't wanna say, I don't wanna hear you say that you believe it and you're not in his word. I don't wanna hear it. The reality is, if you believed it, your life would, would um, show it, would have something to show for it. And I'm not saying you don't, I'm just saying the, the majority of people, you wouldn't be lukewarm. You would be walking in signs, wonders, and miracles every day of your life. You know, a lack of prayer is actually arrogance because you're believing in your ability to make something happen more than your dependency on him to do it. It's actually arrogance. It is the goodness of God that leads us to fear him. And we fear him because we love him. Um, You know, the Bible says his kindness leads us to repentance, not his judgmental church, not religion, not people saying that, you know, you're better than that and you need to fix your life and you're a mess and whatever. His kindness, his kindness leads us to repentance. The fear of the Lord or understanding his goodness is the beginning of wisdom. Because if you understand his goodness, you will not fear anything else. There will be no fear of man if you fear God. If you understand his goodness, there will be no lack in your life because he is your provision. If you understand his goodness, you will wholeheartedly obey him because you know that his plan for your life is better than anything you could have planned on your own. If you understand his goodness, you'll walk in the fullness of his covenant promises. And if you understand his goodness, you will have a holy reverence for him. You will fear him in obedience. You will fear grieving his heart. 
So to bring a, a final definition, I guess, of the fear of the Lord, it's submitting your ways to his in obedience through a revelation of the goodness of Christ and his inability to be unfaithful to his covenant with us. I'm gonna say it one more time. The fear of the Lord is submitting your ways to his in obedience through a revelation of the goodness of Christ, the goodness of the Father, the goodness of the Holy Spirit, and his inability to be unfaithful to his covenant with us. The revelation of his goodness plus our obedience to that equals the fear of the Lord. And I just wanna say, could the reason that we are lukewarm in our faith be because we don't know that he's good? Could it be? Could the reason that we aren't reading the word or spending time in his presence or in prayer be that we are trusting more in our own abilities than his because we don't have a full revelation of who he is? Could the reason that we're walking in lack, in poverty, be because we don't know that he's good? Just a thought. Okay, so how do we do this? We talked a little bit, we talked a lot actually about the, the qualities of God, that he is good, that you know, there's one heart and one way that equals the fear of the Lord. But I wanna talk about there are qualities that we have to have to, to actually walk in this. And so I wanna talk about the qualities that we have to have to fear the Lord. Obviously, number one, obedience. Um, I think it was last year, I heard the Lord say, you will find joy in obedience when you recognize that it's connected to a promise. How many of you do not enjoy being obedient? Be real, be real with me. There's no one, okay, we have a couple honest people. Everyone else, fear the Lord. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, obedience, let's even just take it out of the spiritual sense. Obedience to your parents or to you know, your boss or whoever it is, it's not always fun. Because obedience isn't obedience if it's what you want to do. Obedience is obedience when you don't want to do it and you got to do it anyways. That's so, I mean, really, by definition, no one should like it. It's, it's not fun, right? Like, let's call it what it is. It's not fun. Oftentimes, especially even with the Lord, when he asks you to be obedient, sometimes you got to cut some things out of your life. That's not fun, right? Like, let's call it what it is. We don't have to, we don't have, to have a facade with God. We can be real. It's not always fun, it's not always enjoyable. But when you recognize that it's connected to a promise, you're then gonna have joy in the obedience. For example, if you are, um, let's say that you know, you're a kid, go back to the days when, you, when you're a kid, and your mom says, go clean your room. No, I don't wanna go clean my room. Well, if you clean your room every day for a week, at the end of the week, I'll take you to McDonald's. Now, all of the sudden, you're finding joy in cleaning your room every day. You gladly do it. Why? Because it's connected to a promise. If I am obedient, this is the promise that I can walk into. It's the same thing with the Lord. You know, he says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Why? Because there was a joy in, in the promise of what was going to happen that's connected to his obedience. I do believe that there are real tangible rewards to our obedience with God, but what I want to, to dive deep into today is that our reward is him. If you're not satisfied with your reward being him, you don't understand him. If you are not like bursting at the seams to walk in obedience because of the, the promise that is connected, the promise of deeper intimacy, the promise of knowing his heart, if that doesn't have you bursting at your seams, you don't know him. You don't know him in his fullness. You don't know him in, his, in his, the fullness of his goodness, of his character. The intimacy with his heart is our reward. Yes, there are other rewards. It's all nothing compared to knowing him, I promise you, I promise you. Okay, so not, is there, not only is there a promise connected to obeying, but it's also something that's driven by love. Our obedience is driven by love. It's not driven necessarily by, well, what am I gonna get at the end of it? It's driven by love, yet we know that there's a promise that's attached to it. John 14, 15, this should wreck you. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is a big statement. 
Therefore, if you are not walking in obedience, can you say that you love him? Can you? If, if you're not, let's even just say, like, I, I want to take, like, big sin out of the, let's take that out of the equation. Let's make it simple for people who are maybe not walking in big sin. If you're not in the word, can you say that you love him? If you're not in, in prayer and, like, you know, consistent prayer the way that he's called us to, can you say that you love him? I'm not trying to bring condemnation. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What I'm trying to say is there's a weight to this. Do you fear him? Do you love him? Don't say that you love him and you're walking in all of this sin or all of this apathy. Let's even say apathy. You can't say you love him if you're not, if you're not in his presence daily, if you're not in his word, if you're not praying if you're not communing with the Lord. We can't detach the fear of the Lord with our obedience with him. You can't do it. So that's the first thing. What is the, what qualities must we have to walk in fear of the Lord? Number one is obedience. The second thing is a willing heart. There are so many people that say, I wish that God would speak to me the ways that he did in the Old Testament in a booming voice and, you know, all of these things. Are you sure about that? Do you want to bear that responsibility? Right? Are you willing to be responsible? This is the question. Are you willing to be responsible for what he says when he speaks? Because when he speaks, you're now responsible. Do you really want him to speak now with that definition? Do you really want him to speak as bad as you did before? Obviously, the answer is yes, but there has to be an obedience that's connected to that. There has to be a willingness. God, whatever you say, I'm in, even when I don't like it. And I think that sometimes we don't hear God, not because he's not speaking, but because he's like, I know where you're at right now. And if I speak, you're not gonna follow it. And if, I don't, and if you don't follow it, it's not gonna be good, right? I'm not saying there's punishment, but I'm saying there's, there's a withholding for our protection there because we become responsible for every word that he speaks. So the question is, are you willing to be responsible for what he says when he speaks? If you're not, get to the place where you are because there's nothing better. There's nothing better. We have to value. There has to be a value in us for the word of God. We have to value the word of God. You know, several years ago, again, I was in Zanzibar and um, we we're walking. I remember we we're walking along a path to like get to another house or something. And there's this man on the side of the road. We ask him, do you know Jesus? And he's like, wait a second. And he goes in his back pocket and he pulls out an old newspaper clipping that he had had for, I think it was like 15 years. And he said, it had the name Jesus on it. And he said, is this the, the Jesus that you're talking about? And we're like, yes. And he's like, I've been carrying this newspaper clipping around for 15 years because I never knew anything else about him. The only thing I knew is what this little torn off piece of newspaper says. And I promise you is nothing. And he's like, I've been clinging to this for 15 years, waiting for someone to come and tell me more about him. And yet we have Bible after Bible after Bible at our disposal and we don't even pick it up. Are you kidding me? Like this should be sobering. This should be sobering. Do you love the Lord? How do you claim that you love him and you're not even picking up his words? You're not even picking up what he's speaking. You're not even listening to what he has to say. That's not love, that's religion. So that's the second thing is a willing heart. You have to walk in obedience. You have to be willing to, to bear the responsibility of his voice when he speaks. And the third thing is you have to be poor in spirit. And I heard a, a sermon recently and he described what does it mean to be poor in spirit? And he said, well, the rich have a lot of options, but the poor only have one. The rich, they get into trouble and they can call one of their many other rich friends to bail them out. They go to jail and they can afford to, to pay the bond. You know, they go to the hospital and they can afford to pay the bill. They can afford to be transferred to another one that's a better location, whatever it is. They have many options, but the rich only, I mean, but the poor only have one. In the same way, when you're poor in spirit, 
you only have one option. He is the only option. There is no plan B. If you're rich in spirit, you create many plan Bs for yourself. Well, if this doesn't work out, then I have this to fall back on. And if that doesn't work out, I have this to fall back on. Poor in spirit says, God, you move or I'm done. That's it. We have to be poor in spirit. We have to get back to that place of being poor in spirit. We have to get back to that desperation to hear from God. God, I need you. My entire being is contingent on hearing your voice. My entire everything is hinging on the words that you speak. On the words that you speak. Psalm 107, one through nine. I wanna go through it a little bit. He says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Okay, get this. So you hear all the bad, the bad things about the people. Then it says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them forth by the right way. Remember, we're talking about the heart and the way. Led them out by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Okay, let's, let's break it down a little bit more. Verse six says, they cried out. This is not a passive or casual prayer. They're crying out of desperation. God, I am poor in spirit. You are my only option. You don't move and I'm done for. You don't move and we die. That's literally the place that they're at. If you don't move, God, I'm done. You are my only option. I have no plan B. This is the faith that I have. God, I'm crying out to you for your kingdom to come. I'm crying out for you to move. Your hand needs to move in my life or I'm done for. You cry out because you fear the Lord. We have to get back to the place where we're so desperate to hear his voice, so desperate for him to move that we're crying out in prayer. There's a travailing that is going on in prayer. There's an, a deep intercession. God, we need you. God, you are our only option. We don't have a plan B. We don't have another direction to go. You are our only option. And then it says in verse seven, he led them forth by the right way. Remember the way. What is the way? Righteousness and justice is walking in obedience. As they cried out in desperation for him to move, he led them forth in the way of justice and righteousness. He led them forth in obedience. And then it says in verse nine, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his works, his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. We cry out in desperation for him to move because we're confident that he's good. He leads us in the way of obedience. And as a result, he fills the hungry soul with goodness. We must be poor in spirit if we wanna walk in the fear of the Lord. He is our only option. And you know, people in Africa, they're poor in spirit. That man on the side of the road, he had nothing but a piece of newspaper clipping and he clung to it. He clung to it. Poor in spirit, no other option. God, you're, you're my only option. You're my only option. And that's why I think in Africa, they see a lot of miracles. They see a lot like the miracles that you see in Africa. It's different than here, not to create a place of doubt that God doesn't move here. He absolutely does. And I've seen it. I can testify to it. But you see it way more common in Africa because they're poor in spirit. He's their only option. If their crops are gonna grow, it's not because they have multiple options for fertilization and whatever. It's like either the rain comes or it doesn't. And it's God. My, I fear you, God. I fear you, God. You are so good, Lord. This is what it is to fear the Lord. We can't detach the fear of the Lord from being poor in spirit. So again, we have, we must walk in obedience. We have to have a willing heart when he speaks and we must be poor in spirit. We must have a desperation for him to move. He's the only option. And so if, if you are creating plan Bs for your life, if you are thinking that you can get through life without him every second of every day, if you aren't ready to be responsible for what he says when he speaks, if you're not walking in intimacy with him, in obedience to what he's saying, you're not fearing him. 
and in turn, you're not loving him. Therefore, you're grieving his heart. We don't want to grieve his heart. He's so good. Can I go ahead and call the, the worship team up and I'm going to bring it to a close. Um, I think two years ago, um, I was at one of our Overland conferences, actually, and um, I had this encounter with the Lord. And I just remember it, I was, it was like I was, I was in the room, but I wasn't in the room at the same time. And I felt, I felt the presence of God and I saw myself near this fireplace. <clears throat> and I was like laying prostrate before the fireplace. And I don't know how to describe it other than I felt the weight of God. I felt the tangible weight of his presence, his goodness, like overwhelmed by who he is, overwhelmed by his character, overwhelmed by what he had done, overwhelmed by who he was in my life, just completely uh, overwhelmed. And I'm, I'm laying before this fireplace and it's burning. And I just remember as I was having that vision or whatever it was, I just started calling out all of the accomplishments that I had in my life and I'm calling out. And it was like, as I was calling out, I could actually physically grab them and I was throwing them in the fire. And it was almost like, not an anger, but like a, a passion. Like I would say like, this is something I've accomplished in my life and I'd throw it in. And I would say, and this is something that I've done and I'd throw it in. And these are giftings that are on my life and I'd throw it in. And it kept going and going and going. And I was reminded of the scripture and it actually talks about the fire of God and everything, but that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags before him. And this wrecked me. And I came to the place and I was like, God, I don't care what I've done. I don't care what I've accomplished even for the kingdom. I don't care about my giftings and my abilities and my, whatever it is. Like it's all a filthy rag. The car that I drive, the job that I have, the, the promotion that you get at work, the um, uh, influence that you have around those around you, your speaking abilities, your, whatever it is that like is your thing, I promise you it's all a filthy rag. It's all a filthy rag when you get in his presence and you're confronted with the reality of who he is. When you're confronted with the weight of who God is, all of it means nothing. All of it means nothing. It's all just a filthy rag in comparison to, to knowing him, to walking in intimacy with him, to having fellowship with his spirit. Isaiah 33 verse 6 says the fear of the Lord is his treasure. And I looked up, what does that word treasure mean? And it has a couple of different definitions, but it actually means storehouse, cellar, armory, a storehouse for food or drink. And it's the same word that's used for a treasury of the Lord in the tabernacle, which is where they would go to war. And then the plunderings that they would get from war, they would store it in this storehouse. And yet it says the fear of the Lord is my treasure. The fear of the Lord is the storehouse. What that means is the fear of the Lord is the storehouse that contains all the blessings of God. All the blessings of God are contained in the storehouse of the fear of the Lord, in the storehouse of knowing, having the revelation that he's good and walking in obedience to that. The blessings of God are contained in this place, in this revelation. There's only one heart and one way to walk in the fear of the Lord. You have to know he's good. You have to believe that with every fiber of your being and you have to be willing to be obedient when he speaks. So if everyone can stand up, I wanna give time for a response to this. And I think there are multiple different directions that we can go, but I wanna start with, um, as, the, as the worship team goes into this next song, um, if you have one foot in and one foot out, if you, as I'm sharing, if you're like, oh my gosh, I have forsaken how good he is. Oh my gosh, I have not been walking in the fear of the Lord. Oh my gosh, maybe you're in one side of the divot or the other. Wherever you are at, I want you to make a stand today. This is a time where you can exercise fear of the Lord. Because guess what? There's gonna be fear of man. 
what is the person next to me thinking? What is the person next to me going to think if I go up? Don't worry about that. Fear the Lord more than you fear man. This is a place to exercise that. There's nothing to be embarrassed about, but I want to tell you, if you are one foot in and one foot out, I want you to make a stand today and say no more. I'm in for you, God. I'm all in for you, God. I fear you. I don't want to grieve your heart any longer. I don't want to grieve your heart by walking in disobedience or by walking in apathy or by not reading your, whatever it is. I don't want to do that any longer, Lord. So I want you to make a stand today. And I want you to come up to the front if you feel this way. No one's going to call you out. No one's going to do anything crazy. But even if we did, fear the Lord over man. Let it all go. Don't let that be a reality. Don't let that be a hindrance any longer. And you can't say that you fear him if you're doing it internally. This is like, I'm giving you a chance to, to walk out what you're saying. If that is you and you're feeling that and your heart is pounding right now, fear the Lord more than you fear what other people are saying. We're going to this time of worship if you guys want to go ahead and sing. We're just going to worship the Lord. God, you are good. You are faithful, God. Lord, I just ask that your manifest presence be so tangible here this morning. Let there be repentance. Let there be repentance that marks this morning. God, any apathy that we've walked in, Lord. Any sin that we've walked in, God. Any treating of your word or your presence as common, Lord. You are good, Father. You are good. Let the revelation of who you are flood this place this morning, God touch every person right where they're at, that you would touch their hearts, God, that you would remind them of who you've called them to be and the things that you've done for them, Lord. Soften our hearts to your presence this morning, God. Soften our hearts to your presence. Jesus. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God Your goodness is running after 
It's running.